Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The world's greatest saxophone player is something to be. He's not an African-American, as you might expect him to be, never sat by the Mississippi, absorbing jazz and the blues. In fact, he came upon these genre in the only record shop, as we used to call them, in the unlikely neighborhood of Tel Aviv. That's right. He's an Israeli Jew who even served in the Israeli army. He saw the light politically in occupied Lebanon when he saw a row of small concrete kennels in which he imagined the soldiers kept their Alsatians before discovering it was where the soldiers kept their Palestinian victims, those that they hadn't killed. He went on the road and never turned back to the Zionism of his youth. He's politically fascinating, artistically he's a genius and he's here. Welcome, Gilad Atzmon, to the Sputnik. Uh, um. I, I, I want to get know. some artistic points out of the way because you're too modest to do it. You are on the new Pink Floyd album. For 20 years you've been a blockhead, <laughs> by which I mean the wonderful uh, English band formerly fronted by Ian Drury, the blockheads. Uh, how much of your life is occupied by music nowadays and how much by politics? To start with, I'm not engaged in politics at all. I've never been a member of any party or anything as such. I'm concerned with humanist matters and I write about what does it mean to live amongst others. To your question, I'm playing every night. I'm recording a lot. I'm touring a lot constantly. And in between, I read. And write. This and is your this new is, album. It's my new album. The Whistleblower. Yeah, Tell us it's, about it's it. Just about, it's just about uh, to come out in a few days, in the beginning of uh, January. Well, I, I haven't heard this album yet, but I've heard you play. Yeah. You really are uh, a genius. You are going to teach me uh, to play the saxophone, and maybe uh, on a later edition of the Sputnik, we'll, this uh, be we'll show us uh, uh, doing yeah. a rap. You wrote a book. Uh, which I read with some trepidation because there's been a big job done on you to sure. paint you in a really negative way. Yeah. And I was enthralled, both of us were. Yeah. In fact, I used, and it was the early days of our marriage, I used to read her a chapter <laughs> of your book every night. We went to yeah. bed thinking I, uh, I think uh, this is what I recommend all young couples, you know, is that <laughs> read Gilad Asmon before you go to sleep. It's a sort of contraception. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It was called The Wandering Who. Uh, which is a fantastic title, and titles are really important uh, in books. Tell us what led to the book and what it's about. Um, I really think that uh, we are uh, mis have been misled for quite a long time in our understanding of uh, Zionism, Israel, uh, the work of the lobby, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, for quite a while, I argue that if Israel defines itself as the Jewish state and decorates its airplanes and tanks with Jewish symbols, the first thing that we have to do is to try to understand what is Jewishness. What are the relationship between Judaism, Jewishness, the Jew, what are the relationship between these three and Zionism? These are fundamentals. Now, for quite a while, because of the domination of a, a lot of good Jews, let's say, within the, the left, um, we were prevented from uh, going there. We were only allowed to talk about Zionism or colonialism. Zionism is a misleading notion. Zionism, from Israeli perspectives, died in 1948. Zionism was the promise to form a Jewish state in Zion, i.e. Palestine. Once this state was formed, from an Israeli perspective, the project was gone. For, Ameri for American Jews in Brooklyn or in, here in Golders Green, it is, still, it is still a very vivid concept. But from Israelis, it wasn't Zionism that motivated us or pushed us uh, forward. We were Israeli patriots. Uh, we actually despised the, the so-called diaspora Jew, whom we, we regarded as very weak people. 
Now, apartheid is a very misleading concept. Apartheid is an exploitive racist system. Israel doesn't want to exploit the Palestinians. It wants them out. Colonialism speaks about relationship between a mother state and a settler state. Israel is, where, is a settler state, but where is the mother? Who is the mother? We are using a lot of terminology that is very misleading. I realized long time ago that it is the Jewish identity politics that drives the Jewish state. I face a lot of opposition, but now, just two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we saw that the Israeli cabinet approved the Jewish national bill, the Israeli national bill that determines the primacy of Jewishness in the Israeli state. And those who, by and the way... And democracy. For sure. And those who, by the, who, by the way, like Tzipi Livni, so now she became the leftist, yeah. until two weeks ago she was a war criminal. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, and we are very forgiving. Uh, those who oppose, <laughs> those who oppose the national bill, they don't oppose the essentialist gist of it, they just say, we don't need it because we know that we are we the Jewish state. Down, we yes. don't have to Assume write it down. It, yeah, we see now something very interesting in Israel. Something very, very interesting that, uh, that I am... Something that shocks me and, uh, you know, because obviously I'm an anti-Zionist, but what is so uh, fascinating is Israeli politics at the moment is that it's actually the ultra-Zionists who insist to be truthful to themselves. They say, we will go for this national bill. We understand the consequences. We understand that it's uh, going to jeopardize our uh, foreign affairs and so on and so on, but this is what we are. We are Jews and we want this state to be the Jewish state against all odds. And then we see the Jewish left trying to, to divert the attention from the factuality of the Jewish state. This is what I tried to do in The Wandering Ooh, and I'm very happy, uh, I was very happy to face so much outrage because uh, it only proved that I had something to say. You are Jewish, whether you resign it or I, I'm not. not I, I'm, I'm not a Jew anymore. <laughs> this is something that's uh, very an important. Ex I'm not I'm sure you can resign it, but uh, uh, I'm your sure. parents were, uh, were strong supporters of Zionism and of, of the embryonic uh, I'm from Israeli a right-wing family. Yeah, and you served in the Israeli army. Yeah. So it's quite difficult to pin the label anti-Semite on you, as they try to do on people like me, when uh, nothing could be further from the truth. But he, here's no, the... No, no, but, but, but you're right. <laughs> Every time I was called an anti-Semite or the suggestion that the Wandering who is an anti-Semite text, I said, all right, all right, let's stop for a second. Just tell me, where did I speak about Jews as a race, as a people, as ethnicity? I don't even talk about Judaism. I don't even talk about Judaism. I actually point at the very peculiar fact in Jewish history that during uh, those hundreds of years of rabbinical Judaism, Jews have never been involved as a collective in any genocide. It's actually the process of secularism in the Jewish world that introduced a very interesting and very devastating uh, uh, developments in Jewish culture. So we see uh, Zionism is just one, one aspect of it. Some will talk about the, the predominance of, a, of, a, of a Jews within a, the neoconservative school of thought. Other would talk about predominance of a Jews within the Bolshevik revolution and so on and so on. Something very, very interesting uh, happened at that period of history that starts with emancipation, late 19th century, and uh, we are n within academia. You cannot even tackle this uh, this uh, uh, issue uh, uh, scholarly because you may find uh, yourself uh, being uh, attacked or smeared or abused by some mm. Jewish lobbies, or in my case, physically attacked. Indeed. Let me finish with this uh, point: the man who attacked me converted to Judaism and now when he's released from prison he's going to go and live in Israel where he has an automatic right of settlement citizenship there's a fund that's going to birth, fund his uh, life fund. there yeah a birthright except in his case he was a Christian 
yeah. until uh, very recently. <clears throat> he has no genetic uh, connection to the land of Palestine at all. By Whilst the way, by, but not only that you are right, and your, your attack, uh, uh, the, the way in which you were attacked, and the, and the lameness of the reaction of the, of the British media, mm -hmm. I found it totally devastating by the fact the fact that the, the, by the fact that the guy is a converted uh, uh, is not uh, uh, and was so vile is not very surprising you know we hear about uh, ISIS all the time mm. that a lot of the combatants there are converts from Europe yeah, what so I'm saying what I'm saying and this was my first reaction to your mm, uh, to mm. this uh, vile uh, attack on you is that we have to step up MI5 MI6 a police, metropolitan police or whatever, must step up uh, their uh, surveillance and espionage within within those Jewish communities. How many, how many um, British Jews or American uh, American Jews? Served in Gaza in the last mm, three right. months yeah, in yeah. the in the summer and were involved in this massacre. Yeah. You know? And if yeah, one Palestinian it. or one Muslim had gone to fight Syria. for the Palestinian side, yeah, they'd already be yeah. So this this, this this issues must be addressed. And uh, I'm not working in university. I'm com completely independent. I don't. I'm not an MP. Um, I'm basically a jazz musician. I'm free to say and do what I Speaking like to do. Speaking about your jazz music, <laughs> you mentioned in the beginning that you are not political, but you have very articulate political views. And I was just wondering, how, how, does, how does it influence your music? Do, uh, does it affa affect some audience? Um, would they boycott you because of your style? Uh, there was obviously a lot of attempts to, to boycott me, but I'm, I'm a nice guy. And I'm charming, so when they tried to call me an anti-Semite, it, it was slightly pathetic because I had three Jews uh, in the band. And when they called me a racist, they, uh, again they had a problem because I had a, 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 a black guy in the band. Yeah. You know, all yeah. the, you know, it, it just doesn't. It, it, they never managed to stop my career. For me to be a jazz musician is to develop this ability to reinvent yourself every night. It's pretty much the opposite of a politician, although you are very good at it, I must admit, <laughs> which is genius. Gilad, you we're going yeah, to yeah. have to continue this uh, yeah. another time because we've uh, yeah. run over. You're yeah. a fascinating guy, as I man. said. At Thank the you so much, beginning. man. Keep blowing that. It's great, horn. great to spend time with you. I wish we could do it Thank you, on man. a regular basis. <laughs> Coming up after the break, Manchester is a long way from Motown, Detroit, Michigan, and Motown singer and DJ Miss H is a long way from your archetypal Barry Gordy starlet, continuing the theme of seeing the light and tripping the light fantastic. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. Music has charm to soothe the savage beast said William Congrave in the 17th century. It certainly soothed me in the 1960s when I discovered Tamla Motown and its edgier cousin, Stax Records. Otis Redding, Marvin Gaye, Little Stevie Wonder, The Supremes, The Temptations, Jackson 5, and also, lest we forget, Sam and Dave, Junior Walker and the All-Stars. If Manchester is a long way from Motortown, how far distance is today's X Factor's conveyor belt of manufactured music from Barry Gordy's Soul Factory? Perhaps not as far as you think. Joining us now to discuss the distance travelled is Miss H, formerly from a strict religious background, now a real soul sister, singer and DJ. Miss H, thanks for joining us. It's my thesis that Motown was exactly the same as the X Factor. Uh, you had uh, a maestro, Barry Gordy in the case of Motown, uh, Simon Cowell in the case of X Factor, who put people together artificially, who'd never met each other before mm. as bands, and told them what they should uh, uh, release. And everyone was happy because the world danced, the artists made a fortune, Barry Gordy made the biggest fortune of all. Do you agree with that? Um, I think that 
in the way it's engineered is probably similar, but I think that the complete uh, difference in Motown and the style of singers, the fashion, uh, the words in the, you know, the lyrics of the songs are completely different to some of the things we see coming through on The X Factor. I think, personally, my humble opinion, is sometimes the music we see on X Factor or the show itself is popular because we're told to think it's popular. <laughs> um, you know, with all the exposure that it gets and all the hype that's on the show and the way it tugs at your heartstrings, things like that. But I think looking at the show, there's a lot of engineering and a bit of manipulation of people's emotions. This year's 2014 X Factor, Ben Hainau, yeah. uh, he's a decent fellow uh, with a half-decent voice, but he defeated in the final ballot 10 million people having voted, by the way. Mm. Uh, so it raised a lot of money, that ballot. Uh, Fleur, a black singer uh, with phenomenal talent. I mean, mm. I'll predict that 12 months from now, she'll be a worldwide superstar. Uh, but Ben Hena, a rather ordinary act, defeated mm. her. I take the view, you may or may not agree, that she lost because she was black, because she had a black family, although a white father. Uh, and because her music was black music. And in a poll of 10 million, although there will be millions who like black music, that's not going to be a winner. What's your view? Well, if that was the case, I would be absolutely horrified. There's an actor from the IT crowd I noticed in the uh, Mirror paper um, said that the British public are quite discriminative against black people, which um, surprised me. It was the first time, really, that I'd looked into this. On this subject, I'm interested in it. You're white, uh, but you're a soul singer. You're a Motown singer. Mm. You're a Motown DJ. You play black music. Yep. Uh, the people you're playing it to and singing to, are they black or are they white? And how do you explain it if they're white? Uh, there's a mix, really. Uh, I think the people that I'm drawn to and who are drawn to me like the same kind of genre of music, R&B, hip-hop, soul, Motown. Um, I even get Northern Soul requests, so I've got loads of that. Uh, I think, really, it, without offending anyone, I think it's the best kind of music. It's got the best rhythm, the best vocals. I just prefer it more than the average pop that you get. Mm -hmm. And I really don't like the average pop scene, really. So well, the, the origins of Motown are, of course, in, in the blues, in uh, jazz, banks of the Mississippi, the, urbans, the urban wasteland of, uh, of the ghetto, mm. and so on. I'm wondering how, how that's so attractive to and appealing to uh, people like us uh, who don't come from there or that uh, background. We, we were lucky enough to be on the right side of the tracks. This music is from the wrong side of the tracks. What's the appeal? I think because they sing with so much feeling and the lyrics, you know, they really grab you. I understand that Motown um, and rap as well, uh, the earlier rap does date back to the times of oppression and domestic violence, things like that, and, you know, wanting to be released from the oppression. And I think with some people who understand that, they really, really do appreciate that kind of music. Well, I was there the first time around. Um, I would have been in the dance halls uh, around uh, 67, 68. And this wave, I mean, talk about a hit factory. There, there were hundreds of hit records coming out of Motown uh, at that time. So it was a soundtrack of my youth. Mm. But you weren't born then, and yet you still love that same music tell us why well as you said it's got soul that speaks to your heart and even though i take your point of the x factor and motown being similar music industries factories mm. it's as she said as miss h says the soul that gets through it that gets uh, transferred to the listener is completely different from nowadays from uh, as to the motown yeah. kind but you know the, the this concept of simon cowell people think it's simon cowell's concept of choosing entirely disparate people, putting them together in a band, first of all, has always been done. Secondly, uh, uh, was done not just by black music uh, empresarios, but white. The Monkees, for example, who weren't actually a bad band. 
they were for entire strangers who people were invited to write in uh, to join a band called the Monkeys. And they wrote in from all over the country, the United States, the world. They became uh, big stars. Or One Direction. One Direction had never set eyes on each other before Simon Cowell put them together. Now they're the biggest band in the entire world. And Ronnie Wood of the Rolling Stones was playing with them on stage on the X Factor mm. final. And guess what? One Direction are becoming quite a great band. Mm. You surprised at that? I'm not surprised because I do see a lot of people that are fans, especially in the younger generation, and I think they they are quite suitable for maybe the younger generation. Um, you know, but ten year olds, twelve Woods year older than me, but he was drawn to appear with them because he could see that they've <coughs> kind of got something. Is that is that really the case, or is that just an engineered media stunt? Uh, well, that, that's a good question. I, I think I've got enough respect for Ronnie Wood's integrity that he wouldn't have played with them if uh, he doesn't need the money. Yeah. Uh, he's been with the Rolling Stones for 20 years. Uh, they're playing for a million pounds each per gig. Uh, I think he saw something uh, in mm. them, which means that Simon Cowell saw something in them that turned out to be right. Yeah. Can you tell us how you got into this groove of Motown and soul music and yeah, how your friends and family responded to that? Um, I think from a very young age, I've always been around a um, musical family. My brother used to play saxophone. Um, my older brother used to love his music too. My sister always used to play things like Whitney Houston mm. as she was getting ready to go out, things like that. Um, also. You know, growing up, I, I had a really good chance, an opportunity to mix with an, um, a diverse group of people. So I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. And the main kind of music was Motown, soul, that kind of thing. And I, I just developed a love for it. And obviously looking up to people that were older than me uh, and the kind of music they liked, I think that had a, a measure of influence. And also, uh, since I've been singing, uh, a lot more recently, my partner, he's a, a major lover of soul and uh, R&B, hip hop, and he was the one really that pushed me into singing more soul and Motown. Mm. And since then, it's become quite a success Big for hit. me. Yeah. Uh, give us your website address so people could check it out. MissH.co.uk. MissH.co.uk. There'll be a lot of people hitting <laughs> Thank right you. now. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, talking about music, Motown versus X Factor, it has sparked a lot of debate, let's put it that way. Brandon Hall says both are about product, Diana Ross and the Supremes. Talent does not mean anything, nor did it ever. You want real music? Go and see a live band in a small club. Well, uh, all acts start out as live bands in uh, small clubs. And of course, it's a product. Everything in capitalist society is a product. This television show is a product. It doesn't invalidate it. Mm. The fact that one way or another, you've got to pay to see it, and it's got to be marketed. So I, I don't buy that criticism, I must say. What about Roy G. Simmond? There's so much cynicism here. Pop music is what it is. It is what is popular on the day. Mozart wrote pop music. Motown was great and X Factor reflects that. But what is best is totally subjective. And Lucy Pirelli says, the message is what once took talent and years of hard work can now be achieved overnight with auto-tune and the right hairstyle. I for one have got one. Well, you've got the perfect <laughs> Ronette uh, hairstyle. The, the Ronettes, of course, exactly. were entirely manufactured by Barry Gordy and under the direction of a, a, a very crazy producer, uh, Phil Spector, who's now serving great. life for murder. Yeah, I know, uh, even though so he created that fantastic... The wall, wall of sound. sound. Yeah, I mean, these are all products. I don't know why people are being so sniffy uh, about that. There's one thing I'm going to say uh, without fear of contradiction. On the X Factor, they have Motown nights uh, where the acts perform Motown classics. Fifty years from now, Nobody will be doing garage classics or trance classics or rap. I know you like rap or <laughs> rap classics. Well, Motown has lived, will live. New genre will fall by the wayside. I may sound like a grumpy old man, but that's my point of view. 
Well, let's close it with that then. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can stay in touch with us on Twitter on RT underscore Sputnik. And on Facebook, you can like us on Sputnik on Russia Today. Goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>